אני, אני אעבור לפארס. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ophir Bibi. I'm the VP of Research at Lytrix. And I came to talk to you and all the people on Zoom today um, about how to learn uh, big things with little data. So this is a talk about data, which is really nice for a course named uh, Why Data. Um, just uh, maybe a question about you before we... Uh, it's like uh, there's a delay. About we, uh, you before we start, uh, how far along into the course are you? Just the beginning, a, a month, a month and a half. Okay, okay. Um, so let's talk about what we're going to talk about. There's, I'm going to give you, you know, a little shameless plug, but also tell you like where I come from and uh, what we do and why I talk about these types of problems. Uh, we'll talk about data, data quality, quantity, and everything there is to talk about uh, data. Um, then we'll talk about how to reduce, okay? Reduce, reuse, recycle everything in data models that can help you actually get more with less data. And finally, because there's going to be a lot of, you know, terminology and buzzwords flying around, talk about a couple of real use cases from our work at Lytrix, uh, where we use the, these kinds of mythologies in order to get more with less. Um, all right. So first, like, I kind of knew that you were at the beginning of the course, not because Kostya told me, but actually because Noah, who was in the previous class, told me that you'll be there. Uh, so it's uh, kind of aimed at you, but there's also um, a lot of stuff for people who are even more advanced or have a background in uh, learning, vision, whatever. So um, a little bit about us, right? Lytrix is um, around 500 employees now in Jerusalem, Haifa, uh, London, New York, LA. Uh, yes, we have shuttles. Never mind. Um, and um, we built a lot of apps. We built a lot of apps for creativity. And creativity is basically content editing, creation, and it can be anything. It can be, we started from images, specifically uh, portrait images, AKA selfies. Uh, but then we got into video with video came audio and text, and there's a lot of things going on in the content world. So we built a lot of tools. Um, right now we're focusing on couple of them, building more and more features to help creators create all kinds of cool stuff, uh, kind of like this. And um, we have tens of millions of creators coming in every month in order to create their cool stuff. And we're kind of uh, getting in between, trying to give them not just the tools, but also help them in their journey as you know, creators and um, help them make better art. Uh, put it out there, and whatever can help them. So, like I said, um, I'm the VP of research. I have a group of almost 40 people doing all kinds of things. Um, we do, like I said, a lot of things. We do vision, some stuff focused on faces and people and modeling, more parametric models like 3D face model that you saw and full body modeling. There's a lot of GAN-based editing, both of faces and not of faces, a lot of generative stuff in general. Uh, we also do uh, analysis and synthesis of photos and videos, as well as audio, in order to understand the scene, to give all kinds of tools that can help the creators um, do powerful things with you know, small screens, big fingers, simplified UX, but still have all the power. You, you got to have a little bit of magic behind the scenes. So we're the ones creating that. Uh, we also do recommenders um, in order to kind of float the templates and the user generated content that we're working on now. Uh, we do a lot of core research as well. Um, some of it is actually what we're going to talk about today, like how to get more from less data that's in our core research. 
we also work a lot on the edge. So a lot of our um, um, research is about how to make you know tiny ML and edge machine learning do everything as efficiently as possible. And um, we do a lot of rendering, computer graphics, and that's also kind of why we're called research and not you know the the data science uh, group because we do a lot of algorithms that are also not machine learning. I know, I know, but still. And I got to say that we also have a really strong group of uh, data scientists doing more business KPI and experiment um, planning and, and, and cool stuff as well, which uh, Noah, who told me where you're going to be at, is actually there. So um, just a couple of examples. This is actually a product named BeatLeap. Um, it's a video editing product that takes in um, the audio into effect and helps people create mixes super easily. Um, it's kind of new. We're shifting and turning how it looks, but it had a lot of popularity. And you can just, you know, you, you went on a trip, you were in an event, you have a lot of clips, and you just want to take some of them and create something. So we analyze both the video and the audio. And we create, we let you kind of decide what types of effect you want. We can also suggest them to you. And then, well, there is no sound. Okay. So all the effects are on the beat. <laughs> this is really too bad that that's the sound. Um, I don't know if they... If they Right. Um, like I said, we do all kinds of things. Like this is an example of uh, helping people create more like richer media videos in this case from just still images. Uh, we published a paper in SIGGRAPH uh, just a couple of months ago. Um, and the portion of learning in this one is actually quite small. Um, and we were competing with a lot of big neural networks doing quite similar things and we actually have this out there as a product so this is pretty cool for us but we're not here to talk about us this is just the context of who we are and what we do and we're here to talk about data and if you haven't heard it data is king okay data is king there's no question about it um like Everything that we do in learning, and not just, you know, even if you build an algorithm and you just test it on your benchmark, then that benchmark is your data, okay? Data is always key, it's always king. Um, so just, you know, to kind of illustrate it and give for all the things that I'm going to talk about, like uh, quality and quantity and, and all of that, to give an example from our world, again, um, let's talk about face modeling. So basically what we want, get a face as an input or a crop of a face in this case. And I have a neural network or, you know, any function that gets the image as an input and gives me the parameters describing the face model as output. Specifically, um, we use a parametric model that is called uh, like in general, 3DMM, which is 3D morphable model. Um, it gives us like base vectors of shape and albedo of the look. And we also have a parametric model for lighting and, um, and of course for the rigid pose. Um, and like, it doesn't really matter what the parameters are exactly, like any function that you get, there's an input, there's an output, and you want to get like the the right parameters assuming that there are right parameters so like data and you see this is our you know supervision you get a lot of uh, pairs of images and the parameters that describe those specific faces and you need to learn something now now i can start with the simplest really like even the generate case of bad data. Like if this is my data, okay, 
yet another uh, Y data graduate. Um, then I have an infinite amount of images of Orska here. Um, is it going to be good for me? No, right? I have an infinite quantity, but the quality is, well, it's actually pretty good, but it's limited. It's biased, right? And then, like, if in inference time, this guy comes along, then, you know, uh, nothing good is going to happen. And really, this is, again, like I said, it's the degenerate case of, you know, biases, and, and this is obviously not uh, describing the world that we see out there. But let's talk about something a bit more realistic. Like who here knows uh, FFHQ? Flicker faces, high quality? No. Okay, so this is like a sample of uh, the images. It's a data set that NVIDIA collected in order to train StyleGAN. Who heard about StyleGAN? Hey. Okay, so um, it's a generative network that uh, generates faces. Like if you heard about this is not a real person and all that type of stuff. Uh, this is the network that basically just saw a bunch of images from Flickr of faces and learned the distribution of faces in the real world real world right um and now it can create those types of faces and they're not necessarily it's not uh memorizing anything it's not that it creates just the faces that it saw it's a generative model that can create a lot of different faces that look realistic um throw ideas at me if you had to you know analyze this data set and say like is this data set good for me what would you do? Like an idea, I'll give you the, the start, is I'll run you know, an industrial grade in the cloud uh, gender classifier and see how many men and how many women I have, right? Give me more ideas. Age, ethnicity, race, skin color, yeah, right. Glasses. Eric, glasses, right. Um, so there are a lot of ideas. Now, who here likes to um, likes photography? Like seriously, though? <laughs> Anybody? No? OK, yes. Um, if you look at these images, can you see something in common, kind of? Yeah, no, so it, it, it's, it's good lighting, but there is differences in lighting. But like, yeah, so blurred background is actually exactly because of the types of lenses and focal lengths. And uh, what's the most common type of face images in the world? These guys, exactly, selfies. So uh, this is an image of a selfie taken with a professional camera, which Flickr is a place where people usually put all kinds of, you know, more touched up, good photographs that they took with their pro cameras. But if you don't know that, then all your phones or most of your phones have uh, a set focal point per camera. And nowadays we have two, three, four, five cameras on each device, but it has the set focal point. And when you take a selfie, there is something that's called um, perspective warp. I did not put the images here because it creates nightmares for people, but it um, what it means basically is that the space in the image that things that are closer or farther away from, uh, from the camera, uh, so closer, closer things take more space, aka our noses, and farther things, even like our ears, get kind of squished around. So um, we look very different in a selfie, a real, like real uh, pro camera photograph. You can do this experiment very easily. Uh, ask someone to take your photo once very close, once very far, even with the same type of camera, it will work. Uh, really nightmares, I warn you. So these are the types of things that actually, when we trained on a corpus that was really similar to FFHQ, um, 
we found all of a sudden that it does not work as well when we try it on all kinds of other photos that people take on their phones where our apps are. And uh, it's also true, not just for the 3D face model, it's true for uh, generative models that we used in order to do all kinds of fan fancy edits on faces. It's true anywhere because the corpus does not only have to be big, it needs to be good. Okay, so that's really the issue here. Now, sometimes big is good, okay? Uh, there's, I heard lately, which is why I put this here, and this is like super advanced uh, stuff like visual transformers. It's, um, if you heard about transformers, it's a new type of architecture of neural networks that came from all kinds of places, but really took over the, uh, NLP world, and it's also taking over the vision world um, these days. And there they actually show that when you have the capacity in the model, when the models can actually get so huge that the number of parameters rises and the expressibility of the model increases, then more data is better results. But Again, like if I had an infinite amount of images of the same person, clearly no one thinks that's better. Um, you know, correlations, you can count each sample as one, but if everything is correlated, then it's another, you know, epsilon, and another epsilon, another small uh, deviation. So like this, for instance, shows you how um, with more and more sample, say 10, min 10 million, to 300 million, which is the size of a private Google um, uh, data set. How uh, like smaller models and re like ResNets and convolutional neural networks kind of get to saturation, but the really big transformers kind of go up and up. And I mean, they do seem to saturate a little bit too, but not as much and you can still so yeah so big is in the tens of billions of parameters even yeah parameters yeah um nowadays like i'm not sure actually i forgot how much uh vit uh l l is large b is base by the way um i forgot how many parameters it has but it's in the billions uh, so yeah, um, I did not want to go into like architectures because like, again, I think uh, there's a lot more to go there. And by the way, there is a whole movement of people saying data centric machine learning as if architectures are a thing of the past and it's all solved. They're not wrong, but they're not exactly right. Okay, architectures still matter. Capacity still matters. Uh, it's really important to get the right architecture, sometimes in terms of just capacity, sometimes in terms of the capability, because like I said, transformers is a more, like, it's a more expressive architecture than convolutional networks. It can do the exact same calculation or computation, but it can also do other things. It can see a, a wider um, context for each computation, which again, costs, but you get something more. Right, so, so a capacity is something from the world of theoretic machine learning is basically um, the amount of examples that a model can learn. As in, when you think about supervised learning, you have a sample and the supervision, a sample and the supervision. So a capacity of model is how many such samples can it learn? exactly or approximately it doesn't like there are all kinds of definitions to it but how many can it learn before it starts forgetting for instance before i show it another sample and it learns it but it forgets the first one i show right okay so um now just to make sure that everybody 
is on the same page here. Supervision is awesome. Okay. Like if anybody tells you like here, there's like the biggest data set you ever saw and it's fully supervised and everything is correct and everything is great. Take it, take it, right? Don't try and do anything better than supervised if you do have the data, if you do have the supervision, because right, supervision is really nice. What is it not? It's not cheap, okay? Right? Nobody wants to, like, even a book, right? Even a book is supervision for us. Someone wrote it. It costs money to buy it. So nobody wants to just, you know, go around the world seeking what they can learn without reading anything, without seeing anything, or maybe seeing a whole bunch of things and not actually understanding what is relevant to their task. So supervision is great, but it's costly. And I used to be like in the, in the place where I really wanted to do everything without supervision. And uh, there's a lot of folks that really agree with this and are aiming at it, but like supervision is also important, even if it's just for your benchmarks and your, you know, your test sets, um, you should think about how to get like good supervision. And good supervision is sometimes hard to get. For instance, one of the examples I'll show you is in video. It's really hard to get good supervision in video because there's a lot of motion. And if you do even just bounding box tracking, there's all kinds of jitter and all kinds of things that are interfering. And not to talk about segmentation, which is pixel wise, which is harder. So I'll talk about that. There are other ways to get, you know, great supervision uh, like synthetic data okay this is also an interesting uh, area but not in the scope of our of our talk so let's talk about like okay so i told you you need uh, data that you need good data the right data not just any data uh, that if you can get supervision it's great but that it costs so Right, I want to reduce, okay? I want to reduce either the amount of data that I need to collect because collecting the right data also takes time and effort. And I want to reduce the amount of supervision that I need for the data that I collected because again, some supervision is hard to get. So like, do any of you have any ideas how to do those tasks? Yeah, so augmentation. Right, augmentation is super useful because it's kind of like getting more data, but it is limited to the correlation between things. And it's also useful, but it's not limited to that. Any other ideas? Okay, so let the user do the supervision. Um, so that's a great idea. And um, sometimes it, fits into all kinds of uh, methodologies that are uh, like federated learning and learning on the edge. But it's not because you have to do it on the edge. It's because you have to know that each sample is going to be noisy, that the supervision is probably not going to be great. Uh, but you get a lot of it, right? Right, so transfer learning, exactly. Yeah, so generating synthetic data or um, creating a generative model of the same data that you did get to get more that, of that type of data. And around each of these, there are you know, a myriad of startups and companies actually building it because these things work, okay? That's the point of my lecture. That's the take home message. These things work. So I see that even though you're just at the beginning of your course, you know everything. And I can go, but let's talk about a couple more stuff. Anyway, uh, so who here knows what representation learning is? Okay, okay, there's, there's like a sample. So autoencoders, like what you see here, um, where, you know, it says here the reconstructed data is one way to get to representation. So representation learning is basically saying that um, 
I take my input, for instance, it can be images, it can be text, and it can be whatever. And anything is represented already, right? My images are numbers. They're pixels with either one or three, or if it's multi-spectral, then more channels. And each pixel has that number. It's already a representation, but we all know that that representation is not great for the downstream tasks that I want to do, like classification or creating uh, a 3D model of the face, right, or whatever. So um, what we're looking for is to create a representation, some type of embedding into a different space, usually a lower space than the original representation, not necessarily, uh, where that representation is better in some sense. That sense can be global to say like, I'm looking for the universally best uh, embedding ever. And we can claim that maybe our brain does something like that because we do a lot of things quite well, but we actually have quite a lot of tasks that we don't do as well. And not because we can't get input so fast as computers, but because we just don't do them as well. And um, it can be something very well defined, like uh, classification or right segmentation. So autoencoding is just one way. Autoencoding is a proxy task. I want a network or any model that has this latent code, which is going to be my representation. And I look at the uh, blue part, which is the encoder. It encodes it into the representation, and the other part is the decoder. And I need some task for the decoder because I want to do back propagation through this system. So one of the simplest proxy tasks is autoencoding. Get the input, create a bottleneck, which means that I have to lose some data, and then try and re reconstruct the same data exactly on the other side. Uh, there can be actually a lot of other um, proxy tasks, tasks that are oftentimes called unsupervised, sometimes self-supervised. It's a very confusing area. Um, it's things that I can know I have the function for them ahead of time. Like if I take an image and I cut it into nine pieces and I show the network um, just one piece and ask it where is it? Is it in spot one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine? And ask it to tell me, right? It needs to understand something about the world and about the data in order to, uh, to get to that task. It can be clustering. It can be all kinds of things. Um, but there are a lot of proxy tasks that you can use in order to create that type of representation. The most, one of the most success, successful methods today and actually representation learning today is getting to a place where I teach on a corpus some representation without the actual downstream task that I want and still get as good results on the downstream task as a supervised learning mechanism that learned the exact same task. It's like really getting there. So contrastive learning is actually the like, method of choice today. Um, the self-supervised way is to say, I have an anchor, okay? I have some image, I, I, I pick one sample. And now my representation of that sample should be similar to one sample and dissimilar, uh, different than another one. So it should be similar to myself when I'm augmented, right? If I do a little bit of augmentation, I know it's still the same image. And I should be the like have the similar representation. If I want the representation to also incorporate a little bit of uh, data about what type of augmentations were done, it does not have to be equal, but it needs to be close. What's close? Closer than some other random image that I picked, right? That's contrastive learning. You can also do it in a, a supervised or semi-supervised way. When I say that I have a lot of images. And I don't know if it's the same type of dog, but I know that these are dogs and these are cats and elephants, right? Um, 
then, then you get a bit more information and you can actually use it because unsupervised is great. You don't need anything. But there's a lot of weak supervision as in supervision that is not on the task that you're looking for, but on some other perhaps easier task, perhaps a task that you can get, again, the answers and the supervision for from some API on the web, right? Or open source uh, repository. And you can still use that information in order to add to the learning process. Who here heard about Clip? Okay. So OpenAI uh, developed Clip, which was a, a way, I'll show like the image in a second. It's a, it's a contrastive learning of uh, both words and images. It's a shared space of embedding for and representation, both for text and images. And like what this graph shows is that if you teach, okay, um, um, a transformer specifically for uh, the task of language and, um, and then try um, to get like the embedding of the language and do what is called zero shot. Uh, zero shot means I taught some model to do something. I want it to do something else now, and I'm going to do it without teaching it anything. I'm going to reinterpret the results that it has or change something in the way I feed it input in order to get the result that I want, but without teaching. There is also few shot where you do a little bit of teaching or stuff like that, but, um, and you can see that when you uh, go into the contrastive learning, you get much better results at learning other tasks, which is what a good, like universally good representation should do uh, with contrastive learning. So just, you know, to kind of anchor clip because it is a super cool um, work and thing to use. We use it quite a lot or something similar. Google just built a model that is you know, the same thing, but bigger. Um, basically what we do in Clip is you build two encoder, one for text and one for images. And uh, they used it as bag of words encoder. It doesn't really matter at that point. And then you find, um, and the supervision here basically is which image came with which words. Right, because images on the internet have captions, they come with text. Uh, so again, good data is not just, oh, I'll take any image on the internet. I need to understand if the text that I matched with it is actually the text that comes with the image. I need to understand if I have enough types of images. So Clip was trained on 400 million images and text. Um, and basically the task that teaches these encoders is if the encoding for the text and the image coincide, it should also coincide in the real world and not just in the representation. And then what I can do is take any image that I have. And if I have, you know, ImageNet and I have supervision of like, this is a dog, this is a car, this is a bus, then I can build the text, a photo of a, uh, put your object here and um, the image encoder and test, did I get, um, did I get actually um, the, the classification that was the supervision? In internet? And like the previous graph showed that it got quite fast, uh, like 20%, it also gets to like 70 something percent. It's uh, very useful. So kind of like you said, a different way, and that's a real segue. So you know what, any question till now, because it is a segue, like representation learning, zero shot, kind of creating a representation to then learn other stuff. Oh, okay, no questions, awesome. Um, Yeah. Uh, 
Right? Yes. Supervised learning. So you need some task to learn, but that task can be unsupervised or self-supervised. So um, auto encoding is the simplest thing to think about. I need to create the same input, like the output should be equal to the input, but I create a bottleneck so that it's not a de uh, degenerate case of just copying the pixels from one image to the other or the text embeddings from one place to the other. And that encoding that is created, right, the, the latent vector uh, here, Okay, so like the orange, red, whatever it is there, um, that is created is the interesting part for me later. Why? Because if that representation is good, then I can do later on, I can use it to do other tasks that are of interest to me, like um, examples from the real world. I want to know if two images are semantically similar to one another. Why? Because maybe I want to show the user just one of them uh, and not both of them if they're really similar. So if I look, I can look at pixels and start saying like, is this maybe darker or lighter or whatever, but that's really old style kind of understanding of images. If I have a good representation, a good representation for the visual world will be one where two very similar images have the same representation or very similar, very close together. And something else would look different, which then lets me, without any further learning, actually do tasks like clustering in this case. Um, it can be a more directed task where I want to um, classify, which is actually what we're going to talk about now, which is fine tuning or transfer learning. Sometimes we teach, like we call the encoder and the representation layer, we call it the base model. We cut off the head. In this case, the head is a decoder that really brings, reconstructs the input. And instead we kind of plug in a different head that does classification or, you know, segmentation or whatever. And that head is, it's like, it's a newborn baby, right? You need to still teach it. But the amount of data that you'll need in order to teach that head to do that task is really low because the representation is already making the whole task easier. Okay, that's the point. I can give like a, while I flip through the slides, I can give another example. Um, Eliosha Efros from Berkeley had a work, I think two years ago where he, um, he did uh, video tracking. It does not move. Okay. He did uh, uh, video tracking um, as a proxy task. He put a point in a random place on the video, tracked it all the way, like a couple of frames forward, and then tracked it back. Where should the point be? Same place as he started, right? He does not need anybody to tell him where the point should be because he knows. And he used that as a proxy task to do uh, representation learning. He then cut off the head that does tracking and used the representation for uh, a lot of different tasks and showed that it works as well as models trained to do that specific task or close to as well. Okay, that's, that's the point. Okay, um, so fine tuning, right? You said uh, transfer learning, fine tuning model, taking a model that's someone else trained on hopefully a lot of data, a lot of good data and training it on your data. It reduces the amount of data that you need. That's one thing. Uh, teacher student, right? Which is again, like transfer learning is a big title for all kinds of things. Uh, teacher student is also, you can do it with intermediate, um, like uh, supervision and back propagation of representation layers as well. You can do it just uh, use a big teacher to showcase and do the supervision itself, uh, but it also helps. It helps reduce the amount of supervision that we need. Even if we do use uh, people in order to do supervision, 
it's a lot of times easier for them to start from something that a teacher gave than you know nothing. Um, right, so just to take all of this and put it in the real world, because that was a lot of you know terms, and we covered things that I think the rest of your course should cover, kind of just to give you a bit of real world stuff that we had to do and use. So the, the first thing, and uh, it was supposed to be the second, but then someone on Facebook asked um, here first, is a work that uh, Aaron in, in our team, Aaron Abdullah did, and he's uh, going to Hawaii in January to present uh, in Wakvi about how to create um, supervision for video when you don't have supervision for video. So like I said, video is hard. And the thing is that when we talk about machine learning, a lot of times we talk about accuracy. And accuracy is great, okay? There's a certain threshold where when you're below it, you know this is crap, okay? You know that if I do person segmentation and I cut off my hand or my head, we had that too, it's not good. But then you get to a certain accuracy where things look good. You can't, it, like, person segmentation is not the same task as person matting. It's not like a, a headshot where I want the sub pixel accuracy of every hair to be differentiated with the background. It's something where it needs to be kind of good. And even for that, getting good supervision is quite hard and costly. But we can, you know, we can pay for it. Well, we're a big company. And um, but then if you ask annotators to actually go and annotate video frames one by one, they, they just can't. Like they, even some solutions have algorithms to kind of propagate the mask, but it's not really good. And if the hair moved and one frame they include it and the other they don't, it's really, really hard. So even when you get data, it's usually not that good. And then you get something which is not necessarily accuracy. You get bad consistency or inconsistencies, right? Which the human eye is actually very, very sensitive to. Jitter is super critical when you talk about art and creation. Like if you have a little bit of jitter in the segmentation for an autonomous vehicle solution, as long as the accuracy is pretty high, you're probably not going to hit anyone, right? Because you're not going to go on the pixel towards that person. But if you do foreground background separation and you do one very strong effect on the person and you do another type of effect on the background and you're cutting off the person here, then right, your estimation of their height will be wrong but the, and you don't mind, but the effect will look horrible. So um, actually consistency, right? So this is a consistent example, but it's inaccurate. The accuracy is a bit lower. And this is an inconsistent uh, example where the accuracy is better actually, because we did not miss that area, but it's better. So this is an extreme case just for you to understand, but it happens all the time. And even the reviewers said, like, nobody talks about it. Nobody talks about consistency. Right. So how did we do that? We actually took uh, two frames. And we took videos, just videos. And we used existing models. Deep Lab, in this case, uh, we used a lot of different models. And we used their um, encoders, their pre-trained encoders, in order to create um, you know, the representation and then we use a decoder that for reasons of actually dealing with video, we did not take the original decoder that takes just one frame at a time. We actually did experiments of decoders that take two and up to seven frames. And we output the masks. Now we get two masks for two frames. And the only supervision that we have, right, originally, So, so the mask is, it's again, not moving. So the mask is the result of the decoder. The decoder we learned, okay? 
Um, if possible, we initialize it from the decoder, from the original decoder. But even if not, we learn it. So how do we learn? So the first thing is this. It's the data term, right? Who gives us supervision for the data term? The original model, deep lab in this case. Okay, any model. Why? Because we assume that the initial model gives a good result or generally good result, and we do not want the degenerate solution, right? Uh, no mask at all, or everything in the image of the mask is super consistent. It's not accurate, right? So you have to have the data, the data term in order to be accurate as well as consistent. And then how do you get consistency? So this is the consistency. What we do is we actually run, like I said, it's not moving again, kind of, um, a couple of frames. And, um, and, and then we use, uh, again, pre-trained neural networks for um, optical flow and uh, occlusion masking. And just on the non-occluded areas, we uh, require that each frame when back warp into, into the previous frame is equal, right? Because if we want to be consistent and you know someone has long hair and it blows in the wind, uh, then if we see that it blows in the wind in the optical flow, we want the mask that used to be here to go right where the hair went. And if our hand moved, we want, again, the mask to move with our hand. Um, so, right. Again, this is not working. Okay. So this is uh, this is this area. Uh, we we take each frame, we warp it to the previous frame using that supervision again of optical flow, and of course the better models we get, the better supervision. But that supervision is enough. So just to give you an example of how uh, typical results look. So the uh, naive solution of running the original model frame by frame looks like this. It's pretty accurate, but it's definitely inconsistent. Eilertsen, which is great work about consistency, we'll talk about uh, looks better in consistency, but it's not accurate. And what we tried actually is to raise the bar on getting more consistency without losing accuracy. Okay, because you can always do like temporal smoothing, you can always use some Gaussian blur in order to get more consistency, but then you lose accuracy. Just to show you why it's important. Any questions about this work? No, so, um, so you don't see the, well, you see our ground truth. The naive solution is taking the original pre-trained segmentation model and running it frame by frame. This is our supervision. This is not, there's no uh, frame here showing some uh, ground truth, but you know the ground truth. So in the naive, it's, it's kind of flickery. You see the flickering. So Eilertsen, which is a work I'll talk about in a second. Um, it's all it's less jittery like if you it's hard to compare but uh, we have a visual uh, visualization for it but it's really hard to explain actually so it, it, it's not as jittery it's more consistent but it's not so accurate and we get both accuracy and consistency even more consistency than I the ship yeah just the boat here, the boat is the segmentation here. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so like I showed, we have two loss terms. One is the data loss, okay, the LD, which just, it just requires that the uh, final mask that I get is somewhat similar to the original pre-trained model mask. Why? Because I think that model is good. Otherwise I wouldn't use it as my base, right? And I don't want to go too far from it, but I do want to go 
far enough so that I'm consistent over time. In order to do that, I do inference on multiple frames at a time and require that warping and back warping from one frame to the other is consistent, okay? There is. No, we do. We do. Um, oh, yeah. Um, so the question is uh, basically, um, isn't there some trade-off between accuracy and uh, consistency? And um, there is certainly a trade-off. And we do lose, lose accuracy. And uh, if you look at the paper, uh, it's called Temporally Stable Video Segmentation Without um, Annotations. Uh, without video annotations, uh, you'll see the table that shows you uh, that you have the naive solution. The inconsistency measure on it is high. The accuracy of it is the highest. It's the best model in terms of accuracy. But then when you try different methods like temporal smoothing, like Eilerts and like ours, then you see that the consistency improves, but the accuracy drops. So again, think of it as a, you know, a two-dimensional axis, and you're looking for a Pareto front, right? You're looking for a model that is better than all the others in, in some axis, and then on the other, and, and so on. So uh, there is currently no model that we have that is better in accuracy, um, which also it's, it's, it's a bit hard because... Um, we tested accuracy on different data sets than uh, what the model is trained, as well as the same data, data set, like the test set of the data set that the model was trained on to make uh, fair comparisons. Um, but you see that we get better consistency, but our accuracy uh, drops just a bit and less than other options. Okay, that's, that's the point here. That's the big point. Uh, so I didn't put the, the table here, but... Okay, but we can uh, see that comparatively this specific method in this specific video. So trust me, no, never, never trust me. Okay, um, right. So uh, another example, because really, I think that uh, the more examples you see, it really touches base and, and connects to, to the real world. And because, you know, I had a couple of slides already ready from a previous uh, lecture. Um, so why not? And um, is uh, face modeling in video. So what you see on your left is the face detection on the original video. Uh, bottom left uh, is the, like the crop of that uh, detection. And on the right, you see an overlay of the face model on top of uh, the girl that we see here. What you'll see is basically our face model I think uh, almost two years ago when it was trained for Facetune, which is a stills uh, photo editing app, uh, just run frame by frame. And you'll notice that both the detection and that kind of are jittery. So this is how it looks. And clearly when the detection, because it's a pipeline, when the detection is bad, the model, which is used to getting a very certain domain of inputs of like cropped, um, properly aligned images, now functions, which is fine. This is what we expect it to do. But this is saying like, ah, oh, yeah, video is a couple of frames. It's just a bunch of stills. It's not, okay? It's continuous. We have expectations about and priors about how it should look, and we need to treat that. So just to give um again results that are actually quite old and uh but when we uh, kind of solved the issue of stability um it looks like this so this is an overlay of locations instead of no, so this is just a, a rendering of a location map instead of the albedo of the face in order to see how if I put on makeup in a certain region, if it will stay there or not. Okay, so does it look better? 
much better. Okay, thank you. Thank you. No, but um, it looks better. Yeah. So, uh, so no, we, we, we don't, um, some certainly yes. So technology advanced and in, uh, most iPhones you have, um, the solution, um, uh, you know, the, the prime sense solution that maps your face using infrared. And it gives you, they also opened it as an API that you can get with live video in the camera, um, a scan of your face. They use 3DMM just like us, a different base, uh, but still. Uh, but we try to build apps for everybody and um, not, yeah, and for edge devices and not everybody have the latest iPhones, or it's not so late now, but not everybody has iPhones. Not everybody has the latest iPhones. And sometimes you want to edit a video that you already shot. And if the video was already shot and you're not doing it live, then there's no metadata of like, this is your face. That's, that's accurate. You can, you can. Not all some um you have to turn it on as a developer of the like the video taking app if it's the stock camera it takes some not all uh, because they do have video editing apps in their ecosystem like apple's video editing apps and they want to do effects like hdr and uh stuff like that where they need uh what they save today i think is actually from the back camera, uh, the 3D structure, uh, if you have a LADAR, uh, the 3D structure of the scene. So uh, just to solve it for everyone, we uh, do it from kind of uh, blind. Yeah, yeah, because, so uh, I, I can talk about, so we asked, uh, she puts her hand on, creates uh, occlusions, um, and it still works. So, um, so I, I'm not sure how it looks here, if uh, we put it behind her hand or not, uh, but put it on top of her hand. So we, we handle all these cases, but the interesting part is actually training. Again, um, I'll show you in a second, like how we train this model. But if you don't show it occlusions, then it won't do as well. And if you need to detect not just that there is an occlusion, still give a good model, but also where the occlusion is, then you need to solve for it with the model that you build. Like, yeah, think, yeah, think of the problem you want to solve and then go and find the solution. Don't, like, don't run to, to the best, uh, like, best thing that you think you can build. Just good enough. Yeah, yeah, no, that's exactly my end. Okay, so just to give you an idea of where this came from. So uh, this is ground truth, right? This is supervised learning as you all know it and will learn it over and over again. Uh, I get an input, I have an output from the model. I have the uh, supervised um, label of what the output should be. And I try to minimize the distance. These are augmentations, right? Uh, we take the input, we do a couple of augmentations. We do the same types of augmentations on our label if it does, like if it's a classification, it should not change it. If it's segmentation, the augmentation should do the same thing. If it's adding noise, it shouldn't change. If it's rotating, it should rotate. Um, and then from uh, previous works, and also we'll get to Eilerton in just a second, uh, we can talk about uh, stability. So uh, stability is a term that kind of says how stable is the model. Like I don't care about the ground truth anymore. Okay. I just want the model with changes in the input that should not change the output. I want it to be the same. It can be completely wrong, but the same. Okay. That's stability. Okay. I don't need any ground truth here. 
And then Eilertsen gave um, transform invariant regularization, which basically means that if I take the original input, get the output, and then do the transform, it should be the same as transforming the input and then getting the output, okay? That's that case. I, I want the model to be able to give me the same output just with the transform on. So um, this is not when I want the transformation not to affect it, like noise. Uh, I, when I do want it to be um, output changing, right, like rotations. And um, just a like last project, just to give you an idea how we train that 3D model, we actually, it's called self-supervision, like we talked about at the beginning. Um, our model gives us parameters. Those parameters can be used to render a 3D image like you just saw on videos. And if that image is good, if it's a good solution, it should be similar to the original image. So all I need in terms of supervision is actually um, that the rendered image looks like the original image, right? Now, on top of that, actually to help it a little bit more, uh, we add weak supervision because finding landmarks is a solved problem. It's not, but it's pretty accurate and very uh, common solution. And then we can see that the landmarks on the original image and the landmarks on my rendered image are the same. So when we just you know, initialize a model, we get uh, these types of renders. They're very you know, uh, um, like bland faces in the middle. It, uh, there are distances from each landmark between the images. And then it learns and you get to that, okay? That's kind of uh, what we do. Okay, so just before any more questions, I really want to say thank you for listening and your time and people on Zoom as well. Uh, you've been quiet or forced to be quiet. Um, seriously, if you have any questions besides what we talk about now, if people on Zoom have questions, you can email me anytime. Um, we're growing always, and you know when you finish the course or before, I don't know, uh, you can uh, come and apply uh, to research or not research. Um, and that's, uh, that's it.